looks like this thing's a little taller. We appreciate Jake Schumacher, who's now living with his wife in Fife. Is that right? You're going to be working soon. Where at? In Fife? Federal Way at a church. So we are happy to have him and his wife here to, to do this. And we're preaching on the E100, which uh, Jake will be preaching on next week. Um, but today we're going to be preaching on uh, the Beatitudes and light and darkness and what God's call is for us. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you so knowledgeable of the fact that we are not light, that you are light, and we simply reflect that in our lives, in our words, in our actions. And we just pray that we could be people that do that for you. In your holy name, amen. So in John eight twelve, Jesus says very clearly, he says, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life, of Christ. So Jesus says very clearly, I am the light of the world. And whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, because they'll have the light of Christ. So as I dug through verses about light and life and and what Christ's call is, there was 263 different times that the word light was mentioned in the New Testament and the Old Testament. So all the way from Genesis to Revelation, light is, is something that we see God really values. He is light. He created light. He is light. When he returns, he'll come down with light. And it got me thinking that he's so more concerned about light than he is darkness. Because darkness is simply, as we know, the absence of light. Right? So more light, more light, less darkness. But as we look in in headlines and read the newspaper and watch the news, it seems the opposite sometimes, doesn't it? Which, an aside, is the news loves to report on what? Darkness. Horrible events. Things that that entice people to read it. Because good things aren't as exciting. They're not as powerful. But God thinks the opposite. And so if our news is filled with arrogance and disease and wars and greed and violence, it sometimes feels a little bit overwhelming to think that God can shine his light. And in our limited thinking, we sometimes think it's, it's pointless. That scripture or worship or prayer doesn't really matter. But God promises this very clearly. He promises to have his light with us always. He promises in everything that we experience to nurture the very needs of our hearts and minds. He promises that. And according to Revelation 21, it says this very clearly. He says, he will be with us and we will be with him this is the part that I love. He says, God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain. Talks about light being restored in a dark world. But that's kind of a long ways away, right? We hear about that. There's been cultures and, and Christians and religions that have talked about the end of the world is coming near and it doesn't happen. Because we're still here, Right? And we still experience pain in our own lives. We still experience pain in this world. So what about until then? And a fair question would be even to say, where is God in the midst of this pain? So you personally, where is God in the midst of your pain? It's great to know that one day he'll wipe away every tear. He will have no more death. He'll have no more mourning. But today, there's still death and tears and mourning. So where is God in this world today? So 1 Peter chapter 1, you don't need to turn there, I'll just read it, talks about this idea that we're going to live in a world that's full of difficulty, despair, brokenness. And it's titled, Praise to God for a Living Hope. And so in 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 6, it says, In this you will greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. These have come so that that your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may be proved genuine and may result in praise, glory, and honor. So hear that again. These have come, meaning trials of all kinds, have come so that your faith may be proved genuine and may result in praise. We can't have genuine faith without difficulty, without challenging times, without despair. We can't have genuine faith because it's, it does something remarkable. As you know, when you go through something difficult, you cling to what? 
cling to God. So he uses those. And even you, Anybody here get the Time magazine? I don't know how we got that magazine. It started showing up one day. But Sebastian Younger talks about this same idea about difficult times. And this is void of, of Jesus, but he's talking about how in difficult times, people bind together and they're more happy than when things are easy. So he wrote this whole book and he said this, When soldiers experience life in the platoon or when earthquake survivors experience a brief communal survival effort, everyone's shocked by how good it feels even though the circumstances are horrible. It says that we are getting back to our inter-reliant life and it feels good, it feels really good. So even in difficult circumstances, it feels good to be bound together for a common good. And then in James 1, it talks about all these positive statements about trials and pains and difficulty. And it says this, Consider it pure joy, sisters and brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let it finish so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. I don't know about you, but uh, earthquakes and platoon-style living and difficult situations and trials and mourning and tears doesn't sound fun, does it? Anybody want to sign up for that? I'll take all those. This will be fun. Go through this life. But as I experience in my life, God reveals himself in great light in those difficult situations. And according to scripture, it's essential if we want genuine, persevered faith. So God uses that. It's essential. And then in James 1, 9, it says this, and this is something also I don't want to sign up for. It says, believers in humble circumstances ought to take pride in their high position. So James 1, 9. Take pride in their high position. That doesn't sound fun. Do we celebrate humble circumstances in our culture? No, we, we strive for the opposite. If you look at somebody in a humble situation, whether physically, in their appearance, or financially, in what they have, or what they've done in their life, if it's humble, we sometimes say, they got lazy, right? They got really lazy. And maybe we feel that way about ourselves, that somehow we want to build ourselves up so that we can be in a high position. But God is saying, in a humble situation, that is to take pride in. And then we look in our verses today, if you take out your green thing here. Talking about the Beatitudes. So we know that that difficult things in faith are produced. And then he says here, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Blessed are the merciful. Blessed are the pure in heart. Blessed are the peacemakers. And blessed are the persecuted. Saying those people are blessed. And then he goes on to say, he says, Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. And that's probably a really important thing that's in there is because of me. Because I think in my own life, I've done things and said things that people might have insulted me, but I probably deserved it, right? Because I wasn't acting according to Jesus. But he says that when people insult you, persecute you, falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me, he says, rejoice and be glad because great is your reward in heaven. Is that uplifting? I don't want to sign up for that. But that's the way of light. That's the way of Jesus. And I think what's more important than than the, the difficulty and the trials that we experience, I think God is making the case that this world is temporary, it's always changing, it's not consistent, and it's not life-saving. And he's saying that he is. He's saying the light of Christ is constant, it's consistent, it's forever, and it's unchanged, and it's, it's always going to be in your life. And, and the important thing that he's saying is that it is enough. He's saying it is enough. And in Romans 8.18 it says, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. And later in that chapter, Romans 8, verse 28, it says, and this is important, and we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him. So he's saying that we're going to have trials and difficulty. He's saying that's going to produce faith and that we're going to use that faith to encourage and be a light to this world But he also says that everything that we experience will be very clearly worked for the good of those who love him. 
I think maybe you felt like this before, but sometimes you ever stop and say, well, God, you haven't really blessed me the way I want to be blessed. Or you haven't really done the things for me that I really wanted done. Or why does that person over there get everything? And they're a horrible person. And yet I've done a pretty good job at my life. And this is what I get. Easy to think that. And in the verse today, we see that at the very end. In verse 43, you have heard that it was said, love your neighbors and hate your enemy. And it goes on to say, very clearly, if I could find it. Well, I'll paraphrase. It says, basically, God allows the sun and the rain to fall on good and evil people. And maybe that's not the point. That we get what we want and we're blessed because somehow we have everything that we need. In fact, God's saying is, I am enough Scripture is enough. The word is enough for your life. So again, in John eight twelve, it says, Jesus lived, and he was the light for the world, and he is the light for the world. And then he calls us to something that doesn't sound super fun. After the Beatitudes, which are kind of humbling, he says very clearly, You are the light of the world. Let your light shine before all people, that they may see your good life, and praise who? Praise God. Praise your Father in heaven, that they would praise him because something that they see in us, God working through us and in us, makes them go, you know what, I love God now. Or I want to hear about God. Or all the things I thought about Christians is not true. They are hypocrites, yes, but they're also loving hypocrites, right? And that's what God calls us to, to be people of light. Not fake, not not airs about it, not just Sunday Christians, but people in their life with all their brokenness still say, I love Jesus and I love you. And that's the royal commandment, right? Love God and love one another. So Ellie, she loves when I bring her up. She's a very, I'm not going to have her come up, but she loves it when I bring up her name in the sermon because she goes, what now? What are we talking about? So we live in, in North Tacoma, and you go down North 36. If you've ever been on the Tacoma waterfront, and you kind of wind your way through there, and then you get to the water, and there's kind of like this really beautiful framed uh, view of the water. And there's nothing between you and the water, just a little sidewalk. And when you pull up to the stop sign before you take a right to go to Puyallup, um, you can see the water. And for a long time, Ellie would say, hey, the water's gray today, or the water's blue today, or the water's brown today because the Puyallup River is dumping all that stuff in it. But she would say the water is a different color today. And she always thought the water was changing color. And as you know, what makes the water change color? It's what's above it, what it's reflecting. And so on days that were a little gloomy and dark, it would be gray or it would be white and it would be choppy, it would be stormy. And then days that it was beautiful and sunny like today, it would reflect this beautiful blue radiant color. Right? It was beautiful. And one day she went, it's the sky. It's the sun. It's not the clouds. It's not, it's not the water that's changing. It's the things that are above it that is changing that water. I think that, that story, that illustration is very simple for us as well, is that God is calling us to reflect something that is of light, that is of him, that is of constant value. And so my question for you would be, what are you reflecting in your life? Your daily life, we come to church on Sunday and we put on our nice clothes and we pretend life is great for a little while. But when you go home or when you go to work this week or when you uh, sleep in till 1 or 2 o'clock at Nick's, I don't know what time you sleep in till 2 o'clock, when you wake up, what is the thing that you reflect in your life? Is it the light of Christ or is it the opposite? Because as we know, there's only two things that we can reflect. We can either reflect the light of Christ, or we can reflect ourselves. When I was in high school, and I'll close with this, when I was in high school, the the speaker talked about the human eye. And all of us have somewhat working eyes, and over time they kind of diminish their their ability. But the thing that light, the thing that eyes can always do, even if you're blind, is they can sense some form of my microphone falling off of my chest. Whoop, is that back on? They can sense light. So even if you're completely blind, you can tell the difference between light and darkness. But a good working pair of eyes can see, if you're standing on a hillside, you can see one candle, like that size right there, 30 miles away. In complete darkness, your eye can perceive one candle that size exactly 30 miles away. A 60-watt light bulb, your, your eyes can see from 60 miles away. So if you're in a place where you can see for that long, even though the earth curves every three miles, if you can see perfectly straight for 30 miles, your eyes can pick up that color at 30 miles and 60 miles. It's remarkable, right? 
what the human eye can see. I think God has called us to be that light. And we know that we don't create it. We can't control that light. It's him working in us and through our lives. But God has called us to be the light of the world. And it's small and it may seem insignificant. But there's a lot of people, ourselves included, that are in a valley of darkness that just need one thing called light. And that light is the light of Christ. So again, to answer that question, where is God in the darkness of this world? I would say he's here, right? He's working in us, in our hearts, in our minds. I'd say he's here in scripture. I'd say he's here in worship. I'd say he's here in the community gathered together. So let us be so blessed to be the light of the world today. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you've sent your son, Jesus Christ, who is the light of the world. And you've called us to be people that share that light with mercy, with humility, with complete connection to you. And we just pray that we could be people that walk through this world with that idea in mind, that we are light and this world so very needs it. In your holy name, amen.